Okay, for the last two days of lecture, um, we're just going to work on some review problems. And I'm going to do something that um, I normally don't do in lecture. I mean, students constantly ask me to do this, um, and I've always refused. But since um, this semester it's been hard on everyone, I decide, you know, I have to give you guys um, something. So we're going to hold this lecture outside. So I'm back on my back porch, and we are going to just record this outside. So here we go. So the first problem is asking you to write its formula, circle the stereocenters, and determine whether they are RS. Also asking for you to draw two different chair conformations and circle the most stable chair. A lot to do on this. So first thing to do, let's figure out its formula. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 carbons, hydrogens are 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 1 nitrogen, and an oxygen. So C11, H21, and O. Now if we take a look at this, what we need to do is also, we can double check this by using the double bond equivalent formula, where we take the number of carbons times 2, plus 2, minus the number of hydrogens, and plus the number of nitrogens, and divide that by 2. So 22 plus 2 is 24, 24 minus 21 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 divided by 2 is 2. So we have two double bond equivalents, and we take a look. There's one ring, one pi bond, two checks out, so our formula is correct. And then we have to circle the chiral centers. We have one there, and one there. And then to figure out RNS, we figure out the priorities, and that's essentially based off of atomic number. We have, on this one, all three carbons are tied. So we go to the next carbon over. This one's attached to a nitrogen. This one, well this one's attached to a carbon attached to nitrogen. This is attached to a carbon attached to a carbon. This is attached, this one's attached to a carbon attached to a carbon. So we can really see this by sight that this is going to be the highest priority next and next. The hydrogen will be the lowest priority. One, two, three, that is a clockwise. And our hydrogen's going up at us. So hydrogen straight up. And the hand that matches that, the clockwise with the thumb straight up, is the left hand. So it's an S chiral center. And then we can do the same thing with this nitrogen. This chiral center here, that nitrogen has the highest priority. And here, and here. Hydrogen has the least. One, two, three. That is going counterclockwise. And the only way to get that is if our thumb is going straight down with an S. So both chiral centers are S and S. Draw two different chair conformations. Now, when I mean to draw two different chair conformations, I want you to draw one chair conformation tilted one direction, and the other chair conformation tilted the opposite direction, like so. And then I'm going to number, well, just to make it a little bit more challenging, I'm going to start numbering this right here as one, two, and three. And so I went from the second one from the right. So the second one from the right is one, two, three. This propyl group is a dash. That means it's going downwards. The downwards position is equatorial. 
and we look at it, that carbon, carbon 1, is on the left hand side of the ring. So therefore the equatorial is going to be going towards the left and slightly down. Nitrogen's attached to this carbon, carbon 3. It's a wedge, that means it's going up. And the up position here is axial because the ring bonds are heading up. So draw in the axial and it will be straight up. And we go back over one here. The ring bonds are heading downwards, so the axial position is down. So that purple group is going to be straight down. So the axial will be there. Carbon 3 has a nitrogen on it. The up position here is equatorial. And if we look, it's on the right hand side of the chair conformation. That means it's going to be going to the right, so this group is up and to the right. Now, when decide, trying to decide, we have, in each case, we have one group axial, one group equatorial. <coughs> to try and decide the stability of those two, remember that the nitrogen has is a non-carbon. Typically, non-carbons are treated as less bulky by cyclohexanes than carbon substituents are. And so it's better to have the non-carbon as axial than the carbon as axial. So this is going to be the most stable chair conformation. The last thing to do is ask what the hybridization of the nitrogen is. We take a look at that nitrogen. It has three sigma bonds. That means it can be either sp2 or sp3 because they are the only ones that can have three sigma bonds. To this, figure out the difference between these two, between sp2 and sp3, we look at what it's bonded to. The hydrogen doesn't have a p orbital. This carbon here doesn't have a p orbital. But this carbon here does have a p orbital, so that nitrogen's lone pair wants to be in a p orbital. So, so the only way they can do that is if that nitrogen was sp2 hybridized. So that's A. B is a mechanism problem. Treatment of a compound A with bromine while being irradiated with light generates compound B. Compound B can be isolated and upon heating it reacts to form compound C. Draw the mechanism for the formation of A to B to C and show all curved arrows. Well, let's kind of figure out what's going on here. We have a benzene ring in both the starting material and the product. So we can use that kind of as a marker. So that's one. And then if we count, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven gets to the oxygen. We see that we need to make a C2 oxygen bond. The problem is C2 is an alkane. It only it has just hydrogens attached, and these are notoriously unreactive. And so we have to be able to react with it. But they do react with radicals, light and bromine. And so that's what we are going to be doing. So in this reaction, And I'm going to number these just to make sure I do this right. Light and bromine. Well, what the light does is it splits the bromine molecule in half, giving you two radicals. 
and then radicals like to pull off hydrogens. And you know which hydrogen is going to pull off because carbon 2 is the one that we have to activate. It is also the one that most likely pull off because that's the one that gives the resonance stabilized, the most stable radical possible. And then this radical here reacts with another molecule of bromine. Give this molecule and a bromine radical. So we've activated carbon-2. Now, you might have noticed that I used bromine, molecule bromine, and not the bromine radical. Both get you to the same product. However, this step right here is a termination step. It's using two radicals coming together to make a bond. That is an incredibly rare event and doesn't happen very often. And so that's not the main source of product. And so as a result, that's not the mechanism we need. We should show. We should show the above one, which is a propagation step. Now, we need to make a C2 oxygen bond. We have OH, and we have a bromine. Well, bromine's a good leaving group. A neutral oxygen, on the other hand, is not a good nucleophile, but it can be a nucleophile for SN1. This being secondary, you can do SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. But it also can be resonance stabilized. That really suggests it can be SN1. Also because the oxygen, the neutral oxygen is present to be as a nucleophile. So we're looking at an SN1 reaction here. And in an SN1 reaction, the bromide leaves. Giving you a carbocation. That carbocation is resonance stabilized. And we can have the oxygen attack that carbocation. When we do so, we get a six-membered ring. And then deprotonation can occur. And we give our product. Now, you can have bromide take this off. You can have another molecule of your alcohol take it off. Any of them can take that hydrogen off. What you don't want to do is you don't want to do this. There's a couple reasons why. First of all, an alcohol has a pKa around 15 HBr is a pKa, you know, less than minus 5 or so, there's no way Br- minus can take the proton off of a neutral oxygen. Also, you have a carbocation. Carbocation are high-energy intermediates. If you have a carbocation, 
that's the most likely site it's going to react. And so therefore, reactions should occur there, not elsewhere. So when you form a carbocation, you should use it immediately. Oh, still have to identify what compound B is. Of all these compounds, compound B is this one right here. It's not the carbocation, it's not this protonated one, because protonated oxygens and that carbocation are not compounds that can be isolated. They're not stable molecules. The radical isn't a stable molecule. But this compound B is a stable molecule. All molecules have a complete hot tech and it's not particularly super acidic. Column C is a synthesis problem. Well, you need to make this molecule and all the carbons in this molecule must ultimately come from acetylene, bromobenzene, benzyl bromide, iodomethane, ethanol, or diiodomethane. So, first find the functional group, it's an ether. We make ethers by an SN2 reaction, and we have two possible carbon-oxygen bonds to break. We have A and B. A is the one that you should make, not B. The problem with B is, if you break it at the B site, you get this. This is a strong base, so it can do E2, and it's a good nuclear valve can do SN2. Secondary carbons can do SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. You can do all of them, and so you can do SN2 and E2, SN2, E2. You're going to get a significant amount of E2, and that's probably going to be your major product. And you're not going to get the ether you want. You'll get some of it, but you'll mainly be getting alkenes. So that is not the way to go. When you're making an ether, you make the bond between the oxygen and the least hindered oxygen, least hindered carbon possible. So we want to make A. So for A, Bromide goes on the carbon side, or any other leaving group. And then the O- minus goes on the other side. The bromide, well that can come from lots of different things. You can use it PBr3. That can come from an alcohol. The alcohol, it's at the end, that can be hydroboration. That would react with an alkene. 
You could have also taken this alkene and just use HBr and the presence of peroxides and go right to the bromide because this adds anti Markovnikov. Would add the bromine to the less hindered side. Now this is a terminal alkene. Terminal alkenes, those are H2 and Lindlar's. That would come from an alkyne. We make alkynes from S and 2 reactions. Ah! Here we have benzyl bromide. This is one of our starting materials. We don't have to make benzyl bromide. Check. The sodium acetylide we do need to make. We make that by NaNH2. Like that so. This molecule here. It's racemic because the product is racemic. Alkoxides are made by base, specifically sodium hydride. We act with an alcohol. Um, that alcohol can be made from a couple of different things. You could make it from oxymercuration. That could come from the more substituted and the more substitute side of this alkene. And then H2 and Lindlar's. Brings it back to the, in fact, let's move it over here. Brings it back to the alkyne. That alkyne. Made from this bromide and the sodium acetylid, which we made over here so we don't have to make it again. This bromide, PBr3, and then you have ethanol, which you don't have to make. Now that's a possibility. Other things you could have done. is that alkene, you could have used this alkene instead. And you could have used hydroboration instead of that. Either one with this alkene here will give you that product. That can come from lithium and ammonia. And that gives you this alkyne. The alkyne can be made by reacting iodomethane with a doubly deprotonated acetylide, which is made by simply adding excess NaNH2, sodium amide, to acetylene. Of course, this alkene didn't have to be trans, it could have been cis then this would have just been H2 in the Mars. That's a possibility. Other possibilities.
is we could have used a Grignard reaction. Because this molecule, we could have simply have drawn it like this. In that case, could have used this epoxide and this Grignard. The Grignard, magnesium in ether or THF, either one, it's made by iodomethane. This epoxide, MCPBA, and this alkene, alkene, H2 and Lindlar's, from this alkyne, this alkyne, iodomethane, from a deprotonated acetylene. And of course, we can, we've already made that from this acetylene. So, huge amount of possibilities. Like this alcohol, could have done the same thing, save some steps. Or probably not. Is we could have also done the same epoxide trick. This Grignard, this epoxide, Grignard, magnesium and ether, comes from benzyl bromide, the epoxide, comes from ethylene, ethylene, H2 and Lindlar's, acetylene. So, lots of possibility, any one of those is all right. Okay, D. Write the major carbon containing products. So these are E1, E2, SN1, and SN2 reactions. So, in this one right here, we have a good leaving group. It's attached to secondary carbon. So we can do SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. Strong base, so it can do E2, good nucleophile, so it can do SN2. So we're looking at an E2 reaction. And if we look, our alpha carbon and beta carbon, this is a small base, so we use the beta carbon that gives the more substituted one. Our alpha carbon and beta carbon are both chiral centers. That means we need to redraw the molecule. So the hydrogen and the leaving group are anti coplanar to each other. It means that ethyl group is a dash. Methyl group is a wedge. It means that bromine, that one, ethyl group is a dash. And when you do the elimination, the two ethyl groups end up cis to each other. The methyl group ends up trans, like so. For B, we have an epoxide that's optically active. We're adding acid and, and methanol to this. 
So epoxides act by E2 reactions. Acid means we're going to protonate the oxygen, and then we're going to have the nucleophile attack the more substitute side, which is that side there. So I'm going to draw the alcohol, the O, the epoxide oxygen is going to the top of the screen, so the OH is going to go to the top of the screen. And now I'm going to draw the nucleophile anti it, which is the OME. And then we keep the wedge the same. And start out optically active, and so it will stay optically active because we kept chiral throughout the entire process. Now, you might be wondering if it was inverted or not. It was inverted. The wedge to the bottom became a wedge to the top. If you don't believe me, you can check and figure out RNS. One, two, three. That's an S chiral center. Now, when you're figuring out RNS on an epoxide opening, you must make sure that the nucleophile, whatever it is, whatever it is, has the highest priority. And then the rest of the molecule is that, so it matches the same priorities here. And when you do that, that's an R chiral center. So it was inverted. This molecule here, we don't have a good leaving group, but we have a strong acid, so we can protonate that. So we get this. Now, you might be tempted to say no reaction because that's an sp2 carbon. The thing is, whenever you protonate an oxygen, protonate an ether, you're actually forming two leaving groups. Here is the other leaving group, and that's just the methyl. Methyls do SN2 reactions. I minus does SN1 and SN2. So we're looking at an SN2 reaction, where the products are iodomethane, and then I'm going to draw in the leaving group. Because that's the also a major carbon containing product. D. We have OH, strong acid, so we can make this a good leaving group. It's on a tertiary carbon, so we can do SN1 and E1. Can't do E2. OHs are never good leaving groups for E2. And so we can do an SN1 and E1, sulfuric acid. That's definitely an E1 reaction. And each of those carbons are equally substituted, so we just pick one. This molecule doesn't have diastereomers, so we don't have to worry about adding them both. If it could have a diastereomer, since it's an E1 reaction, we would have to write them both. For example, if that had a methyl group off of it, we would have had to write that. And if we had another methyl group off of it, we had to write this plus, like so. But since it doesn't have those two methyl groups, then you just have just the one molecule. Okay. Molecule here, KCN. Whenever you see a potassium, potassium, get rid of it. Replace it with a negative charge. That's cyanide. We have a primary bromide. So that does SN2. It would do E2 with a bulky base. So, and cyanide likes to do SN2, so we're going to do an SN2 reaction. SN2, SN2. And so we can do so. Okay, 
And you could have also have drawn this flat. So if you had this molecule right here, did the SN2 reaction. That would also be acceptable. Now, the trap on this problem is a lot of people would have written this. And this is incorrect. When you do an SN2 reaction, you invert the alpha carbon. That's the alpha carbon. That's the beta carbon. That is not the alpha carbon. So you have to watch out for that. Okay. E, our mini synthesis, where we need to go from point A to point B. And sometimes if you don't see a way, a good way of going from point A to point B, then start at point B. So what we're doing here is, from A to here, is removing the OH from one side to the other. We have the same number of carbons on both sides. So, what we need to do is if we take a look at this, alcohols, you can make alcohols from grignards and epoxides, but the thing is those add carbons. We don't need to add any carbons to it. We can also make al alcohols from alkenes. And this alcohol can come from this alkene or this alkene. And then when we compare the two, we can take this alcohol to the more substituted alkene quite easily via an E1 reaction. And now we need to get the OH on the less substituted side, so that's hydroboration. Like so. Now you could have made that alkene a number of different ways. You could have changed that alcohol to a bromide with HBr. PBr3 wouldn't work because it's tertiary. And you use sodium methoxide to do an E2. And then use hydroperation. That would have also been acceptable. Speaking about changing alcohols into alkenes, here we have that exact situation. Except H2SO4 won't work because that would give us the more substituted alkene. We want the less substituted alkene. So we need to change that OH into a good leaving group. And again, you can't use PBr3 because it's too hindered for that. So we can use HBr. And then to get the less hindered one, we need a bulky base like potassium terputoxide. You could also, instead of using HBr, you could use tosyl chloride and triethylamine. That's another way of changing alcohols into good leaving groups. Now this has the added advantage that tosyl chloride does not affect alkenes like HBr would. OK. 
Okay. Hmm. And if we take a look at this molecule. Hmm. Looks pretty complicated. Let's do a quick carbon count. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we're not adding or losing carbons. And so our first thought of just changing this alkene and just oxidizing with ozonolysis is out because that would cut off a carbon. Hmm. But if we take a look at this molecule, we could add an OH to the end with hydroboration. That would give us this. But the problem is selectively changing this alcohol to a carboxylic acid while leaving that one alone. Because the two alcohols are identical to each other, so, they, so that doesn't quite work. But if you look at this, this guy right here is symmetric. So what if we just change our numbering? What if we number it like this? We have an alkene, we have an alcohol. We can selectively react that alcohol. And change it into carboxylic acid with a chromic acid oxidizing it. And then what we would we would have then is we'd have this molecule right here. And then we can change the alkene into an alcohol by using hydroboration. Hydroboration won't necessarily affect the carboxylic acid. There we go. Okay. D. Ah. D is an ozonolysis question and says sole product. So this is the only carbon containing product that we get out of it. And it has two carbonyls. That means this molecule likely came from a ring. Specifically, it came from a five-membered ring. Now it's a five-membered ring because when we label it one through five, that connects the two carbonyls together. So carbon 3 has an ethyl group attached. Carbon 4 has a methyl group attached. Carbon 1 has a methyl group attached. And carbon 5 has an isopropyl group attached. Now we need to make sure we have the right stereochemistry. So, figure out R and S. It's one, two, three. That's an R chiral center. Now, we're figuring out this carbon right here. The ethyl group. Let's get rid of these numbers. The ethyl group on the product has the lowest priority, three. The carbon with the methyl group has the highest priority, one. 
and this carbon is 2. Now, it's important to make sure the same atoms have the same priorities as your target product. Because we're just using that to keep track of things in three-dimensional space because ozonolysis is only going to affect the alkene there. It's not going to affect the chiral centers at all. So you have that, like so. And it's an R. In order to get this to be an R chiral center, one, two, three. Oops, that's one, three, two. One, two, three. Your thumb, for, with your right hand, has to be going inwards. So your thumb has to be a dash. So therefore, the ethyl group is a wedge, like so. And let's figure out the next chiral center. One, two, three. The methyl group is, is three. The carbon that becomes a carbonyl is this one right here, so I'm going to label that as one. And this is carbon two. And that is an R chiral center. That's one, two, three. And so one, two, three like this. And in order to do that, the hydrogen has to be a dash. That means that methyl group must be a wedge. And that gives that product. Okay, last problem. Here we're starting out with an epoxide. And what we're doing is we're getting a diether. So when we take a look at this, we have to figure out what was added, because both of them were optically active. We have one chiral center on the epoxide. So let's figure that out. One, two, three. That's an S chiral center. And when we look at the starting material, one, two, three, that's also an S chiral center. So therefore, when we did the SN2 reaction, this side wasn't inverted. The nucleophile, therefore, added to the less hindered side. So it added to carbon 2. So that means this is your nucleophile. So first step is adding sodium methoxide and ethanol. And that gets you to this product here. Now, we need to make a methyl ether. To do that, we have to deprotonate by using sodium hydride, and then add methyl iodide. Okay? Now, you might ask why you just can't do this. Sodium, metho sodium methoxide that opens up gives you the O minus and then add MEI well thing is this is not isolated this is in mixture with this and so you would end up with this 
acting as nucleophile and that acting as a nucleophile. And so that's not a good thing. Here, this molecule here, neutral, it can be isolated. So what we do is we isolate it from all the starting materials, everything that we use, and then expose it to sodium hydride. And as a result, we get this clean nucleophile that can attack iodomethane. Okay, so this is the basically the last lecture that we have. Chem 343, I sort of just combine in terms of some practice problems. I want to thank you for, sorry, not Chem 345, Chem 343, but I still want to thank you for um, taking this course. Um, these circumstances have been very difficult. Um, but I want to say that I am incredibly proud of all of you sticking to this and working so hard at this during a really just unprecedented, un, an unprecedented time. And um, it's organic chemistry is not easy, especially when you have to self-motivate yourself to do this. Um, and I also want to thank you for not um, playing a drinking game um, whenever I say the word um, um that you take a, a, a drink, uh, mainly because if you did so, you would probably have alcohol poisoning by, by 20 minutes into these videos. Um, so, but know that I am pleased with your performance and I wish you the best.